Welcome. Oh my gosh. It is a special edition of Starbase 80, uh, Starbase 80 Supplemental. Uh, I'm your host, Captain John, and um, I'm very lucky uh, because I've got friends who are just like me, who love nerdy stuff, who love being a student of nerdy stuff. And just like we always do on Starbase 80, uh, they like to get together with me and break down and examine Star Trek shows and and mention things that maybe you didn't know. And, and there's all kinds of, I hate to call it trivia. It's, it's more important to me than trivia. I don't consider knowing this stuff trivial. I love knowing this stuff. God, I look awful today. Chambers, look at that. All right, let's get some good-looking guys on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know him. I know him. He is our very good friend. It's Chris Pitcher. Hey! Hey, Chris. How let's are you? And I, I must say I am honored to be the opening quote. Oh, well, it was yeah, just that's my favorite great. quote of the week. <laughs> Joe Townsend is with us as well. Hey, and Joe. Well, sir. the bad boy of Starbase 80. I used to be the bad boy of Starbase 80. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes when you put the clown in charge of the circus, he's not the clown anymore. He becomes the ringmaster. And uh, here's our clown. It's Leo Genesis. Hello. I'm going to say fuck right away to get it out of here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there are literally children watching. Yeah. Leo. That's literally. Yeah. Children they're, they're, watching. They're going to have to learn about tech, uh, tech war somehow. Uh, uh, <laughs> who do you think taught to Leo? There you go. I, I learned it from you, Dad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to. I want to know your reaction because I I have the little windows of all the cameras and yes. all the inputs at the bottom of my screen, and I I watch to see if I make you guys laugh. So <laughs> yes, the quote this week was from Chris Pitcher. Funniest thing I heard all week <laughs> was I said, "Let's do Assignment Earth on Starbase 80." And let's do it with the Carter cast, and um, and we we are working on other shows. I, I I'm going to throw that out there. There is another show right now that we're working on to uh, replace Picarder once Picarder finishes, and uh, we're all very excited about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, it um so in in essence chris is right uh this is a backdoor pilot this episode <laughs> and uh we're talking about assignment earth from uh tos the original series of star trek uh assignment earth was also a backdoor pilot so it's a backdoor <laughs> pilot about a backdoor pilot i yeah. one of my favorite things in the world <laughs> but uh leo i wasn't i i didn't get were you giving me that Okay, is it Scandinavian? Are you a Scandinavian man? I, I, I according to Twenty Three and Me, I'm, I'm a hundred percent European, but it's just like all over the place. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a lot. I have a little bit of Finnish in me, and that was news. Um, and there's sometimes they're like, apparently, I'm possibly Ukrainian somewhere down the line oh, uh, okay. to bring sure. it into the, to the. Uh, to the, the you know current events, right? Also, uh, nineteen point two percent Jew uh, Ashkenazi Jew, which was a total surprise to me. Um, Mazel Tov, Mazel yeah. Tov. There, I get to I get to say that now, uh, <laughs> not ironically. Um, so uh, I like to attribute my my comedic uh, chops to uh, <laughs> there uh, if if there is any you know uh, genetic. Uh, predisposition towards comedy i'll uh, attribute it to that uh but uh anyway you were saying i feel like i i went in a deep uh I, hole of my heritage i just love, a little interest to other than uh, me uh <laughs> no no i just love to uh to poke you to uh <laughs> i just love poke the bear to, yeah. i love to poke the bear and uh so this week i i made a joke about how salty you are ah uh, yes and i was like is that Typical Genesec taciturnness, or did, was it not on the screen long enough? Or no, is it, it was not fine. funny. It's funny. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Craig Lubin <laughs> says, "Don't believe him. He's Romulan." <laughs> <laughs> and Craig, uh, hey, friend pick of up the those show, headphones, Leo. That, that was uh, that was uh, that was a uh, honestly, you know, there was a little bit of that in there. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> there would be. 
There totally yeah. would be. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, are we uh, ready to get to this week's episode yes. of Star Trek? Absolutely. Yes. Um, we have had a a a bit of a discussion on this because um, I one of the questions I had was, is it too spoiler heavy? for us to talk about this on Starbase 80. So I just want to say right up front, uh, if you're not watching Picard season two and you mean to, you should probably turn us off right now. Right. Uh, I, we don't want to lose you, but um, <laughs> we're about to give away what I think is the bombshell of Picard season two. Uh, am I wrong about this gentleman? No, 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 no. Uh, we find out that, a key figure in the story of Picard season two is a, um, a supervisor. Yes. And I had totally forgotten this. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Who called this one? I think it was you, Mr. Townsell. It was me, actually. It was Leo. It was Leo Genesec. Yes. Oh, see, I don't give you credit, Leo. Man. I don't give you credit. <laughs> You know, you you swear, you know, a couple of dozen times during an episode, and that's all anybody remembers. Um, every episode, Leo. Every episode, you swear. I was right yeah. on Leo's heels. Like, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You, you, were, you, were the, you were the first to agree. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is a very important role here yeah, in television. Yeah. Television. Yeah. Um, Leo, uh, tell the folks the uh the secret that you uncovered and were you absolutely sure or how what were what percentage of sure were you when you made this call i would say i'm gonna say 99 percent sure because they can always do a, a you know a, a fast you know turn on you and say oh that was it. it's something else. we're inventing a new thing even though we've got all these other toys lying around that nobody plays with anymore um uh it was it was two things uh, it was the when the laris or uh, uh, ta ta talon i believe talon 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 talon, 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 talon maybe? uh transports maybe. picard out of uh the park in la and it's a it's a rectangle and it has all this sort of smoke in it which mm. is very much the way gary seven transports on assignment earth um mm. and also the supervisor that was that didn't yeah. immediately hit, but when I saw the uh, the square, I was like, "Oh, that's I think that's what it is." It was uh, the visual that got it. Was you. it was the visual? Yeah, that's because much. supervisor. And if, and Leo, if you hadn't been right, Leo, I would have been sorely disappointed. I, I agree. When you said that, I was like, oh, "That would be so cool." Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen. I think it's so interesting that we are engaging with the story of Assignment Earth and Gary Seven uh, in modern Trek, new Trek, as, yeah. as the young people like to call it. Uh, because for the longest time, this was not considered part of the canon or part I, of I, the I immediate mean, canon. It, it was, but it, like a lot of things, as we've discussed, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dominating the room for a moment. For it's now. like old, old, old TV was all episodic and they want, it was designed that way. So anybody could tune in to any episode and not feel lost. Right. Uh, episodic, like serial TV, the way a lot of mm. uh, TV is done these days is very much like, here's a story, and there's like, if you come in in the middle, you're going to be lost. You have to watch from the beginning. So um, it, the idea, it is part of the canon. And in fact, there were two other, you know, let's call them pseudo spinoffs. One were, were a couple of books, and I read one of them where Gary Seven interacts with a young uh, Khan Noonien Singh and Ooh. rescues him and some other of the superhumans from like a testing lab. Um, and there was a second book to that, which I've not read, but there was a series uh, of uh, comics written by uh, and illustrated by John Byrne of X-Men fame, um, very well noted artist uh, mm -hmm. for Marvel, also for DC. That um, was Simon Eternity. Is that the one, Leo? Uh, the book, the novel, I think. Uh, no, I think the comic was a sign of eternity. Yeah, they were. It was. It was also part of it. There was a, a Doctor McCoy series where Doctor McCoy was traveling around, sort of 
Doctors Beyond Borders kind of thing. He was in a shuttlecraft with this mm-hmm. pilot who was taking him around, and uh, they uh, it was uh, it was like a short series. But we actually have if you and they're still available. Um, so if you want to pick them up and you know you know see what might have happened, although I'm sure it's very different from what would have happened on the show. But it, we the characters have lived on certainly in the fans' imagination. And My understanding of the John Byrne series was that it was for the company IDW. Yes. So yes. if you're looking for it, don't look at Marvel. Don't look at DC. Look at, look at IDW. Uh, yeah. I do want to see it, having just read about it, because honestly, I didn't know about it until this week. Right, nice. and I'm a big John cool. Byrne fan personally from his yeah. work, you know, from some oh, years ago. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It was yeah. a great series. I, I actually have seen it, and oh, actually, I think I still own it. For as a matter of fact, to go find it. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, it's so funny. Um, I, I get, uh, I, I had the DC online service for a while. I've got the Marvel online service right now. I never read it enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why I didn't subscribe because I didn't think I would take advantage of it enough. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. I never. My, I never my problem is my my iPad doesn't quite support it anymore, and I'm oh, reading no. them on my phone, and it's it's better than nothing, but right. only, but, only but slightly. Barely? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we told the same joke. Yes. Um, <laughs> we, we should get into this episode, Joe. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, let's talk about this. So. Jump in anytime. Did you know, gentlemen, that this was the final episode of season two of the original series of Star Trek? I yeah. only found that I... out recently because I used to watch Star Trek on WPIX at uh, 11 <laughs> in New York, and they were shown in any damn order. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just so no sense of, yeah. and because it was episodic, it didn't matter, you know? Right. So, well, and but as a season ender for season two, makes total sense that yeah. if there was a possibility of a spinoff happening, maybe the following season. And I will throw this thought out there right away since it just came up. <laughs> season ender for season two beats the hell out of season ender for season two of TNG, doesn't it? Oh, oh yeah, it's great. That's not even go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I remember correctly, Joe, that's the one. Is is that the one where it's a clip episode? It's a total clip episode. It was coming oh. off the writer's strike that year, less episodes, and they had no money left. Yeah, they filmed right. the whole thing in three days. Wow. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. a- and uh, on assignment Earth, um, there was actually, well, you know, it's so interesting looking at the original series of Star Trek because th- season two was a very weak season in terms of ratings. They were losing, apparently, losing viewers every week. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you look at the episodes that make up that series, they are some of the most Mm precedent-setting, important episodes of all of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Except for this episode. I, I think. I do appreciate that Picard is making this episode important. Right. But the main reason it existed was because Gene Roddenberry had a feeling his show was going to get canceled, Star Trek. So he wanted to have a show in the fall. And he yeah. was hoping Assignment Earth would sell. I think you're absolutely right. right. But do you I know mean, what I, I read that I think is really interesting? And I can't understand why the, the series that would have followed about Gary Seven was designed to only be a half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, now that's fascinating because I, while we were watching, um, I mean, while I was watching it, uh, I kept thinking, this is not a long show. This is really skipping like a rock over a lake, right. going really fast. Wow, a half hour show. Now that's well, it's interesting. It, it's also interesting because there's been comparisons to Gary Seven and Roberta Lincoln as being like the doctor and his companion. I would absolutely uh, yeah. and if you want if, if you watch those old doctor who's the tom bakers which is where i came in on it mm-hmm. um those were only half hour episodes it would be like four like four episodes told a story uh but yeah. it would only be they, they were only half hour each so when doctor who came back like the new doctor who and it was an hour i'm like looking at my watch i'm like <laughs> oh i guess it's still going on 
because uh, in my <laughs> mind, Doctor Who was always a half hour show. That yeah. might well, another explain. interesting thing too is that um, had this gone to series, it would have involved an evil alien race called the Omegans, which mm. apparently would have been working in conflict with the aliens that um, recruited Gary. Mm, so it would have okay. had like a quantum leap vibe of them always setting things right that once went wrong, that type of deal. Right? Yeah, he's trying to correct uh, time uh, errors, I guess. That mm -hmm. explains right. a lot. That really explains a lot because mm. one of the problems I had with Star Trek Assignment Earth was the villains mm. in this are the Enterprise. <laughs> uh, sort of. Yeah. Who's who's standing in the way? Who mm -hmm. is who is preventing Gary Seven from saving the day? It's right. Captain Kirk going, hey, I gotta catch you because and honestly, I don't argue with the premise, which is we don't know who you are. Yeah. I'm not gonna let you do what you're gonna do. <laughs> right. You know, we belong, we are of Earth. I don't believe you are. And and that major conflict is the enemy conflict so i wondered as i was watching this like what would the series be like who is the enemy so it is important to know that there's the omegans you say yes that's, that's what i read yes apparently the mysterians were too busy with captain scarlet <laughs> yeah. they, they, their they, games they, were already they, taken so yeah, yeah, they, <laughs> right. yeah no it's funny because i never noticed that similarity to Doctor Who until I watched the episode with my wife, Gina, who is a huge Whovian. And she said to me, you know, so I like Doctor Who. And I went, oh my God, yeah, you're right. Even down to the idea that his servo is shaped like, yes. yeah. like, like, a, like a sonic screwdriver. screwdriver, you know? Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. His looks like a pen. And right. little things flip out of it. But as we've seen on <laughs> Doctor Who, uh, each doctor can have their own version of, yeah. the, of the screwdriver. Right. Uh, there's a female companion. Yes. Mm -hmm. They say over and over again, his ability to teleport, they can't, it's so powerful. They can't tell if he's traveling simply through space or also through time. Right. Yeah. It's a TARDIS, man. That's yeah. how the TARDIS works, man. <laughs> it was crazy because honestly, I never considered that till like two days ago. Right? No, neither did I. Uh, yeah. and now, may, may I speak for a moment to the to the undersung power of Roberta Lincoln, as played by Terry Gar, her power over the men of this episode? Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Okay, get there. All right. Well, number one, somehow she makes Spock forget about the the Vulcan nerve pinch. Yeah, he's got her and he's wrestling with her, and he, right. just, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, right. that go, flies out of his head, right? And then, plus, here's Gary Seven on the uh, in the transporter room of the Enterprise, he's able to beat off. Uh, well, excuse me, that's a bad choice. Of he's, <laughs> he's able to defeat, um, yeah. you know, five guys, shrugs off, same nerve pinch, yeah, he's yeah. he's yeah. he's immune to it, yeah. yes, but Much later on in the episode. I, I, I kind of expect him as an enhanced human to have some kind of spider sense because uh, Roberta sneaks up behind him with a box and whaps him over the head. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something <laughs> you know, about Roberta Lincoln that just captivates these men on some level. I don't yeah. yet understand. But you know, Joe, it could be that Spock doesn't try the neck pinch on her because he knew it, it didn't work on Gary Seven. And he's not 100% sure that she's not just like him. Mm. He could have been gun shy for a little while. He did it yeah. a little bit later, so I'm glad he, he might, got that mojo back. But yeah, might be, yeah, yeah right. speaking of mojo, he might be feeling a little pawn far. I mean, come on, like <laughs> Terry <laughs> Gar and a, Listen, like a uh, Nelson. Come on, if, 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 if I had a 20 year old Terry Gar wriggling around uh, me, uh, yeah. I would find it hard to concentrate. Yes, uh, uh, point well taken. <laughs> I I want to now bring up the coin, and we'll do both sides of the coin. Um, the first side of the coin is. How wonderful Terry Gar is in oh, this. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, she hated doing it, apparently. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, that yeah. actually, I think, is a significant part of the show. Keith Jacobson is with us. He says, ah, Terry Gar, my first celebrity crush. Heart. Absolutely, yeah. 100%, man. <laughs> so cute. Um, really not a beautiful pilot, uh, the Assignment Earth pilot. Uh, a lot of the photography looks uh, grainy. Um, a lot of the pictures look overblown, mm -hmm. except when you get to those 
close-ups of Terry Carr's face. Yeah. Uh, right, right. That soft focus. <laughs> yeah. That Those Star Trek is perfect powder blue eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, She's wearing that blue uh, eye shadow that yeah. the gals were wearing in 1968 right. and uh, just rocking it, just making it look absolutely fantastic. Just a beautiful face, beautiful peachy complexion. Anybody uh, want to speculate where Roberta, uh, Roberta uh, Lincoln's other mole was? No. <laughs> Her star a star shape mole. A star shape Jeez. birthmark. <laughs> I'm going to say... Um, what what how do we refer to that area uh lower back yeah <laughs> lower lower back and Here, here's reason, a here's a kid word tushy yeah <laughs> that's a, always here's a sunday a morning a sunday morning word yeah always we'll ask tushy. a parent yeah. tushy. i'm gonna say tushy right side that's how i yeah. picture okay. it. i would go with that i can't argue with that Craig uh, Lubin points out Terry Gar was 19 when she filmed uh, this episode. Wow. Crazy young. Crazy. Wow. And so good for so young, yeah. by the way. I mean, she's uh, always had a great comic timing, which definitely oh, yeah. this this episode, because oh, yeah. everybody, Kirk and Gary Seven and Spock and Scott, everybody's like mm, serious. And you right. need somebody to sort of, you know, eject a little levity into the proceedings. Right. So true. Absolutely agree there. Um, so let's talk about the reality of this episode. Terry Gar never spoke about working on Star Trek. Yeah, she never she did wanted not to have be involved. A, they go ahead, Lee. What I read is they kept sh like making her skirt shorter and shorter, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure for a 19 year old is probably like, what are you doing? And I also, this is the only episode where Gene is listed as a producer, not an executive producer. And he had his hands all over this episode. Ah. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that he was, you know, uh, doing anything uh, untoward, but on the other hand, uh. we know Gene's reputation uh. and uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but she, right. she, yeah. she had a very unpleasant experience oh. and she's like, and she felt like, I'm glad it didn't go to series because I would have had to answer questions about this, like, you know, throughout my life and probably beyond. Well, and um, she had so, a tremendous career. Oh, I yeah. Mean, I mean, young we were Frankenstein talking about and it's, yeah. just everything. Well, you just, know, yeah. just prior to this, she was making Elvis movies. Yeah. I mean, she oh, made okay. Elvis <laughs> movies in between 1964 to 1966 or 65. Wow. Speaking of someone who wasn't cool around younger women... Yes, Elvis Presley. <laughs> Elvis had a country boy sensibility about oh, uh, <laughs> well, thirteen. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty adult. Yeah, apparently Gene was the one that was you know uh, putting forth the edicts to get, make that skirt shorter and shorter. And oh, you the know. thing I read was, uh, and I'm sure you read the same thing. Uh, you can see the hem on the skirt mm -hmm. is so bad. Mm. And it's because Gene kept saying, nope, make it shorter, <laughs> make it shorter. Right. He, he wanted a little Hooters waitress thing going on there. Yeah, he right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it probably so, explains a bit why at the end when they um, go to the historical accounts and say you'll have many interesting adventures together, both Robert Lancey and Terry Gard kind of like, oh, shit, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got happy about it. <laughs> but it's, it's, oh, it's, wow. it's, it's such a TV line. <laughs> where the idea, like, I can't wait to oh, see, yeah. hear about the adventures. Of course. If, of course. if you Tune in next the, season. <laughs> yeah. You recall yeah. the, I'm going to do a, a slight detour here. Uh, the Simpsons did their spinoff special. And there is one where Clancy Wiggum becomes a PI in New Orleans. And Lisa's like, I can't wait to hear about all the exciting adventures <laughs> you'll have in this colorful backdrop. Um, <laughs> and and right. it does feel like he's like, like Gene is like putting that line. He's like, come on, guys. This is good. Come on, let's yeah. Give me another show. Uh, I mean, uh, it's gonna, gonna be gonna, great. It's gonna be yeah. great. I mean, I'd like to have two shows, but at least one. Um, Let, and let's talk about that just a little bit too, because this is actually something that the four of us are kind of obsessed with: is Gene Roddenberry constantly trying to get other shows on the air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that uh, I read was. Um, the idea that aliens are trying to help the earth in a, you know, sort of hidden way that shows up again in the Questor tapes. That's yes. What, I've right. never seen that. I remember reading about it in Starlog Same. magazine, yes! uh, but it was one of those things that got 
aired once maybe and with no publicity so it just yeah. sort of like you can yep. you if you blinked you know you yeah. missed it and i've yet to see it so being but. a night owl uh even as a child uh cbs used to have a late night movie right mm-hmm. right um uh, now they do talk shows late at night but but back in the day they would do a movie and uh the quester tapes would be on like once every year every oh. other year Mm-hmm. Um, How did I, I miss saw that? it when I was super young. I don't remember much of anything about it. Uh, the same with Planet Earth. Uh, Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Thank <laughs> you. Genesis 2 would show uh, very late at night. Marion Hartley. Do you remember the promo? Marion Hartley had uh, two belly buttons. What? Yes. You know why? <gasps> no. Because they wouldn't let Gene have one in Star Trek. So he had two on his <laughs> next show. <laughs> Yeah, Greg Lubin <laughs> points out Quester Tapes was the precursor for the character of Data. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, unquestionably, um, Gene Roddenberry, we know from the motion picture, he reused a lot of ideas from Star Trek, the motion picture into uh, the next generation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, phase two, the um, TV uh, series that was proposed in the late 70s, a lot right. of those ideas rolled into well. That's the the uh, the, the Decker uh, Aaliyah relationship is very much like Riker and Troy, right? right. Um, like a complete lift, really. Yeah. In, in I also ways. noticed, and and if the other day, I don't know why I was looking at it, but if you look at the original pilot, the cage, the whole color scheme of that episode is pretty much just like Star Trek: The Motion Picture. The uniforms are muted. The bridge is gray and very pale and black. It's very it's similar point. to yeah. the look and that he went back to for that motion picture, which is do really... We ju- do we judge Gene Roddenberry for this? Is is this, like, is that bad? Is that good? What do you, uh, Joe, what do you think? I don't think we judge Gene Roddenberry for it. Uh, as far as his uh, personal foibles, well, you know, that is what it is, but as far as how he uh, approaches entertainment, you know, Harlan Ellison, I think, put it best. And I'm, this is not a disparaging comment or meant to be. But Harlan said, you know, Gene is just not, he's not a writer. I think he actually said that Gene can't write for Sour Owl, owl Poop, is how he put it. <laughs> right. Damn. But Gene was a great, he created the universe. He's, he's right. He, you know, that's, mm. I think the reason Star Trek was so strong at the beginning was because there were so many great writers and directors involved. Right, expanding right. on that universe so no i i don't i i give him full credit um absolutely for creating the universe of star trek um and what he contributed as far as writing was pretty good yeah and i, actually, stuff yeah. From other I actually liked making that discovery because mm-hmm. i always wondered why did they go to that very muted color mm. scheme and mm. i know part of it was because they didn't think the bright colors would play on the big screen but it also made me think it, it makes it it heartens me to know well maybe gene just thought well that's what i really wanted in the beginning mm. and they wouldn't let me do it so i'm gonna do it now because i'm gonna make a movie and it's mine so oh, i, I mean, think so too yeah that, that makes the, sense the division colors for the uniforms for starters and the um illuminated walls of the of the sets of the, especially the first year or so Mm-hmm. You know that that's NBC saying, "Hey, we're selling a lot of color TVs. We want color, exactly. right? Yeah, right. right. Exactly. exactly. Uh, the the gimmickry of color television. Um, you guys know, I'm Chris. You've watched almost every episode of Batman, right. uh, this 1966 through 68. <laughs> yeah, I think series. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Three years. and uh, crazy amounts of color. Mm-hmm. because they're basically saying hey you know we've we've got to get this idea of color out there craig lubin is uh piping in about gene rodmary don't forget andromeda was supposed to be about starship traveling into a future where they have to restore the federation in the show it was called the commonwealth of planets yeah that's right uh gene rodmary's andromeda which yeah. uh I never recommend to people because I don't like Kevin Sorbo. Yeah. <laughs> but the story itself, yes. And really not too different from what's going on on Discovery. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, was, it was good to see some posthumous success of some of Gene's other ideas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, all, uh, they, all man, they needed to take out the equation was Gene. Um, <laughs> I the wish man who that kept was re- wrong. Uh, he kept rewriting stuff. Have you ever watched Center Chair, the uh, doc- documentary series about Star Trek, where he kept like like intercepting scripts and rewriting them, sending them to oh the studio God. heads, who yeah. would be like, "This is garbage. What's going on?" And the writers like, "I didn't write that." Yeah, uh, <laughs> that so, happened over and over, and that yeah. happened a lot in this episode. Yeah, uh, because he uh, it was Gene who retrofitted this episode so that it would fit into star trek yeah um was it a good fit do you think leo i'm it's i'm not sure i don't think it's a bad fit it's kind of an interesting idea and like i said unfortunately because it's episodic they never returned to it until recently so it is sort of a weird thing like there's the thing like kirk is like yeah there's a planet somewhere you know that is hidden from us even in the 23rd century Mm -hmm. and uh, they are interfering and in trying to keep Earth from, uh, you know, falling apart and presumably other planets as well. So that you, you you report that to Starfleet and then to the Federation, you think they'd be a little concerned. It feels like like something that somebody should be looking into. Uh, but like a lot of Star Trek episodes, well, we sort of fixed that problem. So time <laughs> to hit the bricks. I'm on the Spock's brain. Uh, exactly. Uh, brain, but, brain, what is brain? But, uh, <laughs> One of my favorite lines. Yeah, exactly. Back I, to I, the I, regular I, I, old I, jackassery of Star Trek. I'm sorry, Leo. Yes, I'm not. It's a, the thing is wh- whether it fits into the Star Trek. It's there's a lot of stuff that we've never returned to. Like until recently, the Medusans, which we saw in one episode. Uh, uh, what truth uh, was it? What truth and beauty? Um, yeah, I think um, so. Yeah. Um, right. And there's a character from uh, Prodigy who is a Medusan who's yep. in this sort of, you know, kit bashed, uh, you know, robot body flying about. Right. Um, which seems Great to have a back. Yeah. It's cool yeah. to bring those stuff back. But the, the, the problem is, it's like somebody's like a writer's like, hey, what about these crazy aliens who do this thing? And we're like, oh, that's cool. But we never <laughs> see them again. I mean, the fact is, we only see the Klingons, I think, in like three episodes of the original series. But they are considered like wow. the greatest uh, three to four. I'm, I'm yeah. it's some, it's somewhere, uh, And yet we, we don't get to like they were considered the mortal enemies of the Federation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were their their main adversaries politically and militarily, but they, they the fact that they came back at all is kind of remarkable. Yeah, because um, it's not like they ever did. Like we're going to have the season where there's a new war with the Klingons, which would have been an interesting, uh, you know, absolutely. TV. But you know, that's not the way TV. TV they wanted TV to be. Everything is bite sized Everything is like mm-hmm. sit down. You have your Swanson's TV dinner. Um, mm-hmm. And you uh, you watch this. And what's regular uh, to any of these series is the original premise, the original core. Uh, there had been in the original script, I kind of love this, when they're orbiting Earth, they intercept a signal and they're oh. instantly watching Bonanza. Yeah. <laughs> Which I just love so much. And, and part of the reason why I love it is because... I think they're telling you just in that move what television was like at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the most popular shows, Bonanza. Uh, just this idea that pop culture uh, was huge, that television was huge and influential at the time. It absolutely was. Uh, Craig Lubin uh, throws in uh, Star Trek Next Generation completely ignored the episode where key Federation officers were possessed by crap load of alien parasites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never going back to that. <laughs> I think I think the that's what the Borg became. Oh, um, oh because because the Borg are originally supposed to be insectoid. Yes. But that was too expensive. Yeah. Um, Right. And so, so they just know, glued they, some hoses and plugs to a bunch yeah. of people's faces, they just, and just like look like a bunch then, of like German bondage uh, figures. Uh, oh, when you look at the way they when they were first introduced as characters, the Borg costumes are pretty cheesy. 
Yeah. The first episode, you see the here and why are they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Put a hologram over their eye, you know, like you buy it a gift shop. Yeah. No, that was uh, that was definitely the uh, the genesis there because, um, you know, the following episode after conspiracy, of course, was neutral zone when we were introduced to the concept of something scooping whole colonies off the face of the planet. Yeah. Oh, right. oh, interesting. Yeah. I love, I love that you guys know stuff I don't know. Now I know it. Now, well, you know what's also interesting about this episode, and I, you know, it's not necessary to know why, but the Enterprise took the time to do a slingshot maneuver to go back to the 1960s for a reason, which they never end up revealing what it was. I mean, then you know that they were there to observe, mm -hmm. right? Research, right? But you and for research purposes, they never accomplish whatever that mission yeah. is no yeah. because they get all wrapped up with gary seven right and Who they didn't expect yeah and then at the end they go well the enterprise was supposed to be a part of this because yeah. you know <laughs> the missile we're, we're here to see how we survived the year it's, 1968 uh, yeah, right. <laughs> here's, a, here's an interesting uh, uh bit of tri not trivia but a uh, uh, sort of weird synchronicity is when they're discussing Kirk is like says to Spock. So, what what's happening now that's so crucial? He's like, well, I could fill up a a day uh, like a tape bank, which is a very uh, you know. <laughs> I 1960s. assume that's a lot. Yes, yeah. um, uh, this, there will be an important assassination today. But Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated six days after the episode aired. Um, wow. And Damn. they also talk about a, a coup in uh, in Asia. And it was a, it was at that period that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, took over, uh, right. I guess, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and, there, you know, so there, it was a weird prescient. I mean, I, obviously, there was no thing, nothing supernatural involved, but it's the right. kind of thing where you like make it like, hey, maybe we'll do this. And, you know, and that actually happened. It's I mean, given the time it would took place the idea that there could be an important assassination happening uh because it was still living memory of of j of uh rfk's uh right. very public right. assassination so it it feels like oh well and i'm sure the writers are like well that'll never happen again um you know but it did and also later that year uh robert kennedy jr was assassinated so right. um right. i'm i'm sure the studio was probably none too happy about those coincidences it is a pretty, uh, yeah. it is pretty sad uh, looking back on it that way, Leo, too, when you consider that um, you could easily put in a line about there's going to be an important assassination day because at that time, as has as happened since, there's always right. that real possibility there will be actually right. an assassination yeah. in the real world. Right. And they treat the whole thing like, as, as Chris points out, this is the only time in Star Trek history that I can recall that time travel is treated like it's something routine. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah, like, oh, yeah, we just did the time travel thing. So, anyway, yeah, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, that was like a big deal. Okay, yeah, well, okay, let's jump to our other show for a brief second. With Picard, it's a big deal again, yeah, right, right. They need well, help well, to do it. Of course, it's every other time they're in like some rickety piece of crap spaceship, you know, that's right, it's ready to yeah, fall apart right. when they try to go shoot around the sun, but right, regardless, you know, yeah. It is an and, enterprise. And uh in Picard, uh season two, Picard, uh, they um they basically explain why the enterprise or the enterprise crew was able to do this. It's because they had Mr. Spock to do the yeah. calculations right. as it right. was happening. Right. Because that to me was one of those. Well, I mean, if all you have to do is fly around the sun, then why doesn't everybody with a steam runner right. just yeah. do that? You know, yeah. Uh, obviously, the time cops will get mad at you, but you know why isn't it happening more often? And and we find out why. Of yeah, course, yeah. you know, da data could do that. Data could easily do that. Oh yeah, um, oh certainly. But they never did. I guess right. it's against the law now. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys about the man who plays Gary Seven. Actually, I found the casting in this episode fascinating we've already talked about terry gar mm -hmm. now we're talking about robert lansing 
Uh, does anybody know? I actually should have done this. Does anybody know other stuff that Robert Lansing has done? I can tell one thing that since you already Mary, uh, mentioned Marriott Hartley, yes. I should have made a note of it. Pop in, guys, if if I if you know it off the top of your head, but uh, Lansing and Marriott Hartley appeared in the Twilight Zone. It was the episode where one of them, they were he was going to be going on some deep space mission. He was going to be an old guy by the time he got back. She used to be a young chick. Mm-hmm. And that was basically the episode. I wish I'd looked up the title, but it, it was in the third or fourth year. I, but, I, I can't say I, I remember from anything else, but he looks like one of those actors who worked a lot because he was like a good, like, he was a good looking guy, tall guy, square jaw. Lots you know, of Westerns. But I sure. think that's a, that sure. so many Westerns had to be the bulk of people's resumes right back then. Yeah. <laughs> right. 50s and 60s. Absolutely. And wasn't um, it interesting that. This is, I think, this is the only episode of Star Trek where the guest star appears in the opening credits. Yes, not yes, the right. yeah, yes. When it, when he's in the transporter room, and that yeah. was deliberately done uh, to sort of, you know, give him a little extra juice when they're trying to sell this series, which yeah. sadly they did not. Um, I would have liked I to have... watch that show, but it's, I, it might have been terrible too. So maybe. Oh, but... hey, yeah. Cliff Diamond uh, jumps in. Oh. I actually just read this. Twelve o'clock high, the TV show. Twelve o'clock hey, high. He was a star. Hey, Glad to have you with us, Cliff. Uh, yeah. Um. Here's a theory I want to uh, pitch. I don't know how controversial this is. Ooh. I say, <laughs> Gene Roddenberry definitely knew about Doctor Who. Debuted in the UK in 1963. Debuted in North America on CBC. Um, debuted in North America in 1965. It is now 19, 1968. I, but I don't think it's a direct lift. I think he also wanted to do a spy show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The whole James Bond genre, Man from Uncle, all the all that stuff that came from that. Yeah. Uh, and and here's the thing. I have a very specific reference that I think Robert Lansing was following. I do believe he's following our man Flint. Oh <laughs> James Coburn. Right. Mm-hmm. There, there is a yeah, yeah. <clears throat> unlike James Bond, unlike Matt Helm, this is not a guy who's making out with chicks. This right. is not a guy who's just there for you know being a horny dude. He's he's got this very kind of zen relaxation about him that reminds me very much of Flint, uh, Derek Flint. Um, also, James Coburn had a very like loose limbed kind of walk mm-hmm. and way of moving uh, because he was a martial artist. Mm. And I see that in Gary Seven. Gary Seven's fight scenes look a little bit better than the fight <laughs> scenes in Star Trek. <laughs> He's a little more um, martial arts influenced, I think. Um, mm. Any pushback on that, gentlemen? No, no pushback. No. I, 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 it, it makes total sense. Well, you know, wasn't it Plato, I think, that said, it's as far as uh, philosophy, <laughs> that there's only about a dozen truly unique plots and mm. concepts. It's just what you do with them that makes them unique. Right. Mm. So I again, I can't so. fault Gene Roddenberry for not coming up with something totally unique oh. on, on that in that genre. Oh. No, just, just uh, on a side just note, his take on yeah. it. You know, this is just a weird observation. Gary Seven's little gizmo, his pen, his yeah. his, his Sonics uh, uh, Scrivener. Um, uh, he yeah, when he zaps people, when he stuns people, it's not like a phaser stun where you just collapse. You just become super suggestible and kind of dopey because he'd be right, like, right. It was like, oh, why don't you sit down there and have yourself a nice nap? And I was like, okay, you know, well, I yeah. mean, but we do know the brain has a pleasure center, yeah. And so mm. I was watching that going, oh, well, that's that's like a good superpower. Uh, uh, Star <clears throat> arrows, uh, in yeah. Star, uh, Marvel Comics had that power yeah. too. If you can trip somebody's pleasure center, then. You just put them basically in this. <clears throat> it's Sunday morning. You basically put them in this uh, state of <laughs> physical bliss. Sure. Right. Say. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's maybe not a big O, maybe a medium O. I don't know. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> well, keep it's Sunday so, clean. <laughs> so, so here's here's the American spin on Doctor Who. The servo, which is why I think what it was called, yeah. right, does right. have a kill setting. Yeah, oh, it does it is I, not I, a Doctor. That's true. Thing when at all. when yeah. Roberta Lincoln points it at Kirk and Spock yeah. when she she does her heel turn, I don't know. It's like <laughs> again, who's who's the who are the good guys in this? Um, uh, and Gary Simmons knows this. You know, it was on kill setting, yeah. and he gives it to Kirk because right. he's like, I'm just I want to show you that I'm not a threat. I was right. a little. I mean, it gives it. It's a it's a good moment in that he's saying, hey. You know, I, I'm not here to kill anybody. I'm just here to help. Right. But it is a little disappointing. One of the things that I love about Doctor Who is it's ultimately a very positive outlook. It's about finding nonviolent solutions to, you know, you know, solutions where everybody is like pulling guns on each other. Right. Um, right. Very anti-gun. Which is a very British idea, given yeah. the Britain's very strict gun laws. Mm. Um, and it's a very British idea. Um, yeah. in, 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 you know, as opposed to, of course, there are a lot of really shitty British ideas, uh, <laughs> which, which <laughs> we will not get into uh, right now. But, um, but I think you could say one of the things about Britain, this only just occurs to me now, uh, the, the, um, the country, the kingdom, the empire has a long, bloody history. Oh, very. To, to say that, <laughs> oh, they're a bunch of wimps because they don't believe in, you know, picking up guns and doing battle. Oh, that's not the British. No, <laughs> no, no. These guys, they practically lost an entire generation in World War One. Yeah. Right. The, they, this uh, is, yeah, yeah. It's very relevant. Leo do, you, Leo, do you remember when we were in London for that the three weeks or however long we were there? Yeah. We were living with those other people that were also actors. Yes. Yeah. There was a television series on at that time. It was a cop show, but it was set in London. Yeah. And most people were chuckling about it because these cops were running around with guns. Right. And of course, the the London police don't carry firearms. No. So it was, I remember them commenting on that about how sort of ridiculous it was. It was, it was very, very American. Very American. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, gentlemen, we are 10 minutes till the end of uh, really being able to use this show. Uh, if, it goes over, if it goes over an hour, it's actually problematic. Uh, so uh, let's get back to our, well, let's get to final thoughts. We didn't really do a plot synopsis so much no, on this didn't. one, but. It's a, it's a well-known story yeah. at this point. Yeah. If you're uh, watching this and you haven't watched the episode, why are you watching it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a few uh, additional. Glad to have you. Nice little and things. I have to disagree about this one. So. Oh, two, two, oh. Two, two nice little things. Just details. Yeah. I'm actually yeah. kind of making one up myself, but to see uh, Finnegan's ancestor in this episode. Yeah, you're saying what? Oh, that's so funny. Bruce As Mars played both Finnegan right? and the cop ah. in, the, in this ah. episode. Yeah, I, mean, I, I have to assume that was his his ancestor, right? Yeah. And the other nice touch, I just, uh, yeah. I just think it always just makes me smile when Isis goes through the um, turbo, you know, the elevator door or the the door, yeah. At the you know, going back to Earth, yeah. it opens this way. <laughs> now, how, how does it know to do that? <laughs> Couldn't it have been an alien who's like thirty pounds but three feet wide? I don't know. Right. It was cute. <laughs> uh, and let me just throw this out to the. Um, the 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 thing about uh using a cat first off never work with children or or animals <laughs> right that's just an old show business trope yeah. uh the i mean it's very difficult to work with cats i love cats but they're not a working animal necessarily no. did it did it bother you guys the way it bothered me because i've owned black cats my whole life uh you know <laughs> you know three cats one of them's a black cat um if is it just me or were they constantly using different cats? They had three cats. They three. had three cats. Okay, because yeah. one of yeah. them had big chubby cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> the other two are like really sleek, and then there's like you know meatball. <laughs> like hey, what's up, Boy, guys? Voice provided by Barbara Babcock. By the yes. Way. Oh yes. Oh my God, my favorite thing. 
about this whole episode is Barbara Babcock plays uh, uh, Gary Seven's computer. She yes. plays the cat. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> you may remember Barbara Bab- Babcock as being on screen. One of the most beautiful women who ever did Star Trek, as far as right. my, I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Played her stepchildren, Taste of Armageddon. Right. And um, she was the Tholian. The Tholian, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she, was, she Also, I remember her uh, from <laughs> Hill Street Blues. Oh wow! Oh, I didn't, didn't oh, yeah. remember. oh she went on to have a, a lot of, a lot of. She was, I think, she was the captain's ex-wife, if I'm, rec- if memory serves. Uh, you might be wrong on that one because. But, but uh, she was. Uh, I do feel like she was on the that Dottie show. The Dottie ex-wife. Right. Yeah. She had the Dottie ex-wife, and but she. Why do I remember her on that show? I don't. I. I that is a... that is that is apocryphal. <laughs> I don't know if it's if I'm just have a Chris... weird. Thing. Chris so. Pitcher, uh, final thoughts, final, final things well, to throw you know, um, we didn't really touch on on ISIS much. Um, and to throw in that little humorous bit at the end where the cat actually turns into a woman uh-huh. and sitting there giving Terry Gar the stare down, you know, and and the back and forth. And then, of course, Seven says, um, you know, oh, that Miss Lincoln is just my cat. You know, and <laughs> back, and there's the cat again. Um, and is that the moment where they hit the shot of the cat, and it just all of a sudden goes? <laughs> I don't know. You know, well, it's it, enough. all of a sudden has an ear scratch at some point. I just remember that. Um, and yes, Olga Brady in Picard is wearing a outfit that has a, a kind of a collar on it. Yeah. Yes. So now she, um, were you the one who shared this, Joe? Uh, that uh, the woman playing uh, Talon. I think it's Taylin, uh on uh, Picard season two, who is a supervisor, a supervisor. Yeah. Right. Uh, and you, was it your theory, Joe, that she was the cat? <laughs> yes, that was. Yeah. Joe. Yes, I, I will take claim to that one. I, I, and I'm not, I'm not unique in that. Others on the internet have as well. But yes, I, I'm convinced. Well, that is her. she posted <laughs> she posted on uh, social media this week a picture yeah. of herself, and I can't remember the exact caption, but it was something like, "When you're pretty sure you used to be a cat, but you don't know <laughs> why you think that." <laughs> yes. Right, like that. yes, yes, you yeah. know, when Leo- Isis, Lareth, yeah. it's pretty yeah. similar. Oh my God, it is similar. Oh boy, <laughs> Leo Genesec, uh final thoughts, final observations. I, I have one little bit of trivia. This was. The weekly narration for the uh, never produced uh, assignment Earth show. In the hands of this one man could rest the future of all mankind. His name, Gary Seven, born in the year 2319 AD, the only survivor of Earth's attempt to send a man back to time today. Assignment, fight an enemy who is already here trying to destroy us. If he fails, there'll be no tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Talk about stakes. <laughs> uh, so uh, I I'd never seen that till I was I was digging around uh-huh. earlier on, and I was like I'm like that is new. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's yes. old and new. new, but, new. Uh, There's a lot there. Holy that cow! That is because it was originally they were he was from the future. That was the original pitch. <laughs> Um, interesting, interesting. <laughs> Fred Robinson says, I was tuning in to our show simply for the witty banter and Leo cursing. There fuck you yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, there are children watching, <laughs> gentlemen. That should do it for us. <laughs> the equivalent uh, of, of nerdy Saturday morning cartoons today, uh, Christopher Pitcher. Um, are we ready to start discussing an upcoming? I, I we don't have delighted. to get specific if you don't want to. No, no, I would be delighted to. Um, with um, the the coming of uh, Strange New Worlds, um, I'm working uh, on a show with uh, uh, Leo, um, which will be a discussion program about that show, and that show will be called Trek Tonight. We already have uh, space on on Facebook um, and on YouTube, so we're ready to go. Um, and that will premiere hopefully on the 6th of May, okay. uh, which is a Friday. Um, and we're going to do that particular one on at seven o'clock. Uh, one, because Leo has uh, something to do later in the evening. And two, because we're going to be doing a last episode of Picarder 
the day before. So <laughs> yeah. it's going to be crazy. You know, we're just right. bum, 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 bum. Right. Yeah. But yeah. The media empire continues. Yeah. Uh, uh, Leo, uh, besides Trek Tonight, which I'm very excited for, uh, what else would you like to plug? Uh, well, as you can see, tr at Trek Haiku, which is my uh, Twitter feed in which I post a new uh, Star Trek-themed haiku every day. And also go to genesec.org, J-E-N-I-C-E-K.org. Uh, every Monday, I post a new story or rambling uh, diatribe. Uh, Few of those Emily, diatribe that doesn't sound like you at all. <laughs> what <laughs> I know, uh, I haven't done one of those in quite a while. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> definitely do that's, one. Uh, that's that's mostly when I like I don't know what to write, so I just like <laughs> the random crap in my head. Uh, but I am currently writing a pro union uh, high fantasy story uh, oh. about oh. Goblin, about goblins who who are like. Why are we working for these evil wizards who treat us like shit? Maybe, <laughs> like, we're guarding a, a, a chest full of magic weapons. Why don't we use that instead of, you know, the stick with a nail through it that had been given to me? Um, so, and the and sort of the the uh, all the repercussions from something like that happening. So, uh, uh, Chris, for Craig Robinson, will you please uh, tell us the name of the Facebook page that your Star Trek? Uh, I'm sorry, Strange New Worlds show will be on. yes um it's um it's going to uh, well there's a link to it right now um i don't have it here um right. but i believe i don't have it, it is simply trek to night n-i-t-e which is um sort of an inside joke for leo and i um and a, a deep cut reference to <laughs> yeah. very obscure show uh that was on in the 70s called america tonight Fernwood Oh, I remember Fernley. Fernley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so, yeah. Uh, next week, next week, I promise I'll have um something we can put up maybe in here. Yeah. Where my yes. Name is. yes. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's do and, that. And then we'll have that. Um, <laughs> you can write to me on that at Trek Tonight, I believe, uh, twenty twenty at gmail dot com. Oh, cool, cool. All right. We'll definitely get that information as we get closer to the debut. Yeah. I know that this is for you, Leo, from Keith Jacobson. That story is awesome, by the way. The Thank you, Keith. unionizing <laughs> couple. <goblins. laughs> and uh, to your constant swearing, Craig Lubin <laughs> says, think of the children. <laughs> <laughs> Not my kids. Think of the young one. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Townsell at JoeTownsell.com. What sort of goodies can we find if we visit you at JoeTownsell.com? You will find uh, information and links to buy all of my dark and bizarre works, as I call them. <laughs> <laughs> Critics uh, call them that, too. <laughs> that's, that's great. Critics that's what I'm looking Joe. for. And I did promise you guys, oh, don't forget the um, my Amazon author page. And I did promise you all a great sign-off today from me. And here it comes. Oh, yeah. This is courtesy of Isis the Cat. Live long and prosper. Oh! oh. Damn! <laughs> Damn! Uh. I thought it was going to be live long and prosper. Oh! Believe me, I'm Gene Roddenberry, you. I'm rewriting you. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Go down! Oh, you are